So I'm Ben Jones. I'm part of the organizing committee um, for this conference. I'm in the School of International Development at the University of East Anglia. So welcome to this um, keynote talk. Um, I'll just throw a few words at you. Um, the anti-politics machine. Anthropology. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Did you say how brilliant that was? Oh. <laughs> the anti-politics machine. Anthropology's evil twin, which we heard invoked this afternoon. Global shadows, the uses of neoliberalism, give a man a fish, the politics of distribution. These are all terms, phrases, ideas, concepts, debates, which we've been encouraged to think with through the work of Professor James Ferguson. Professor James Ferguson, the Susan S. and William H. Hindle Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences, and Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Stanford. Um, Professor Ferguson has his PhD from Harvard, taught in California at Irvine, and is now based in Stanford. And today he's going to talk to us, continuing his work on the theme of distributed politics. He's going to try and extend our ideas about presence and ownership. I won't say much more now, but I will say one anecdote from when I was a much much younger person, when I was starting out in my PhD, in those days when you couldn't order everything online immediately from Amazon, I was at the London School of Economics, and there was this very, very nice anthropologist, which will be known to many of you in the room, Suzette Heald, and I was traveling over to the United States. And you might have noted in my little introduction, there was one particular phrase from Professor Ferguson's that I missed out and that was expectations of modernity. And she was like, well, Ben, it's coming out here in a few months' time, but can you get me a copy? Can you get me a copy? Because I want to read it. I want, I want, I want to get that American edition. And I was traveling to the US, and I brought Professor Heal, Suzette Heal, back a copy. And I think that, that, in a way, is a testament or a way of encapsulating the way Professor Ferguson's work has been something we've all thought with, something we've all engaged with, something we've all, all took time to wrestle with, to make sense of, and in some ways to anticipate the future of both development studies, I think, and of, and of anthropology. So that's all I'll have to say for now, but Professor Ferguson will talk for about 45 minutes. Um, then we'll open it up to questions. If we could keep those questions brief, that would be very much appreciated by the speaker. And uh, we'll aim to finish around quarter past seven, but without further ado, uh, Professor Ferguson. Thank you, Ben, for that uh, extravagant introduction. Um, and to Emma and to all of the other organizers, thanks for making this happen, um, for making this visit uh, possible, which has been a rewarding one for me. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to say something about the conference theme. Um, but then I looked at the conference theme, and it was a little bit daunting. Um, anthropological perspectives on global challenges. I think it's daunting because anthropologists are generally skeptical of grand stories about what the world does or doesn't need. And our disciplinary modesty tends to reject the role of solver of global problems. Our perspective on so-called global challenges usually offers not neat solutions, but rather a sense that they are immensely complicated and far less tractable than many current discussions we have. Certainly, we are far less comfortable tossing out supposed solutions to the world's problems than are our colleagues in some other disciplines, more comfortable than we with radical simplifications and modeled predictions. But perhaps we should not interpret the conference agenda in such a grandiose spirit. Seeking anthropological perspectives on global challenges might rather be taken to entail something a good deal more modest than peddling comprehensive global solutions. Perhaps something as simple as seeking to apply anthropology's knowledge and insights to understanding issues and processes of broad scope and significance wherever we find them and at whatever scale is appropriate. 
Indeed, I'm largely in sympathy with such a move. But let us be careful not to allow this concern with such issues to be misunderstood as a valorization of so-called real-world concerns, as opposed to those of what we too easily refer to as theory. For I think real anthropological progress on understanding the kinds of large-scale issues that the phrase global challenges evokes hinges largely on a necessarily theoretical process of conceptual rethinking. The challenges we confront, that is, are first of all challenges to our accustomed ways of thinking. So when in this evening's lecture I present a discussion on certain new forms of politics and policies involving distributive claim making, it is not in order to valorize these new politics or policies as the answer. As if to say, yes, here's the solution we've been looking for. It is rather to point to some of the ways that our thinking is having to change to keep up with changes in the world. If there is a global challenge that I seek to address here, it is first of all this conceptual one. My route into these issues has been via what I call the politics of distribution. By that phrase, I mean most simply the political question of who gets what and why. And the claim that I wish to make here is that labor and citizenship, long the anchors for our thinking about these questions of distribution, no longer provide an adequate way of answering them. Both in my own area of specialization, Southern Africa, and across the global south and beyond, the old answers leave out huge populations. As Tanya Lee and I have argued in a recent paper, growing masses of unemployed and underemployed and the rapid expansion of precarious and so-called informal livelihoods challenge the idea of universal inclusion through integration into a stable formal sector workforce, a world of proper jobs. Meanwhile, an increasingly mobile global population leaves growing numbers all over the world undocumented and thus lacking citizenship rights in their places of work and residence. At the same time, I will argue here, emergent new forms of distributive politics show the importance of different kinds of distributive claims in these times. Claims based on neither labor nor citizenship but on what we might call, in the broadest sense, ownership on the one hand, and what I term presence on the other. I will explain these rather cryptic terms shortly. But let me start by reviewing very briefly those long established old distributive ideals grounded in labor and citizenship. And here I briefly refer back to that paper uh, with Tanya Lee. With respect to the labor side of the story, all across the world, a kind of meta-narrative of economic progress promised as a culmination of the development process, the universalization of waged or salaried employment. A modern society was a society of jobs and job holders. That this promise has so often ended up a broken one does not seem to diminish its attraction as is clear in rhetorical appeals of politicians the world over. Jobs, jobs, jobs. But the limited ability to think beyond the promised land of jobs for all afflicts not only politicians but scholars as well. Indeed, the proper job has served for so long as a presumed norm or telos of development that we are too often left with a stunted and reactive set of categories and concepts for thinking about all the other ways in which people make their way in the world. This is perhaps why discussions of so-called precarity so often rely on residual categories of analysis, unemployment, informal economy, non-standard employment, instability, insecurity, categories that render everything outside the world of jobs a kind of negative space, defined by that which it is not. 
there was a powerful vision implicit in the idea of an emerging developed world in which paid labor might provide the basis both of a stable livelihood and of a kind of social membership or incorporation for all. As people left their pre-industrial, rural, agricultural, or pastoral livelihoods in such a conception, they would be fitted into the modern new order precisely by having a job, that enchanted object that still provides the normal answer to the question, so what do you do? A set of gendered expectations about the breadwinner and the family, the organization of time and space, the role of formal education, respectability and virtue, and contribution to the nation were rolled up in this notion of the proper job. Today, as that imagined universality gradually recedes in the rearview mirror, its once dominant status begins to become visible to us as distinctive, perhaps even strange. As Guy Standing once memorably put it, the 20th century in retrospect now appears as what he called the century of laboring man, a time when the life way of what had been a small fraction of the population, the stabilized urban working class, became quite suddenly and somehow for many quite convincingly projected as the future of all. And if the century of laboring man is, as Standing argues, at an end, it is not because stable waged and salaried employment is disappearing in any absolute sense, but because it is losing its plausibility as the universal solution, the obvious telos of a worldwide developmental process. Whether due to the globalization of supply chains and labor markets that undercuts established working classes, the persistent structural unemployment and casualization induced by neoliberal restructuring and so-called austerity, or the recent and looming technological developments that threaten to eliminate or drastically reduce whole categories of paid labor, the old transition story no longer convinces. One effect of this lost conviction is the apparently worldwide contemporary anxiety about jobs and the social and economic stability they were long expected to anchor. The anxiety springs from a perception that increasing proportions of the population across much of the world can no longer rely upon or even plausibly hope for the sort of stable waged or salaried labor that has long counted as the proper job. And this worry is not confined to poor countries where whole populations appear as surplus to the needs of capital. In rich industrialized countries too, the loss of manufacturing jobs and general economic insecurity also raised the specter of what Michael Denning has termed wageless life. Some of this anxiety is about raw unemployment. But even more pervasive is the sense of insecurity and uncertainty evoked by the now widespread term precarious, an adjective that today finds surprisingly broad application across regions and social classes. The term's wide application is surely simply mistaken if it is meant to suggest a single shared set of substantive economic conditions, as if a freelance computer programmer in Silicon Valley and a shack-dwelling casual laborer in Lusaka are somehow part of the same unitary precariat, as some would have it. But for my purposes here, what is significant about precarity is the way that it surfaces a set of issues that go far beyond purely economic ones. Just as jobs were never only about money, the anxiety I reference here is not just about the loss of income or the threat of falling into absolute poverty but also about the wider implications of increasing casualization, subcontracting, freelancing, improvising, all the flexibility, uncertainty, and short-termism that so undermines the real or imagined certainties and temporalities of the old breadwinner world. The anxiety is, is thus not just about paychecks, but equally about issues of identity, gender, family, national membership, and so on that were so long anchored by the social ideal of the proper job. 
Indeed, in the political domain, the nation state has long provided the same sort of anchor of stability that the proper job was supposed to offer in the economic. A legally authorized political membership, in theory at least, underpinned a set of explicit and universal rights and obligations. And this too helped provide the answer to that central question of distributive politics. Who gets what and why? If income in labor terms was seen as a reward for work, there always remained the question of all those who did not in those terms work. That is, those unable to work or whose work was not paid. Society being composed not of individuals, but of domestic groups, often understood in highly idealized terms as families, legitimate dependence was part of the distributive story. In this old story, children, old people, and often reproductive women as well, were styled as legitimate dependents, dependent upon the worker, the breadwinner, the head of household. But there were also others unable to work, due to disability, for instance, or the unemployment produced by the unpredictable vacillations of the business cycle. And here, the nation state stepped into the spotlight, especially in the form of so-called welfare states, that, where they existed, offered a different kind of legitimate dependence in the form of direct social payments to the poor and the so-called safety net. Social assistance, perhaps the purest instance of direct state intervention into distributive outcomes, here was pegged directly to the two anchors of distributive politics that I have identified. First, it was generally available not to workers, but specifically to dependents, children, the elderly, the disabled, the reproductive woman, a kind of photographic negative of the laboring man, that able-bodied worker, the breadwinner. And such support was available, again, nearly always, only to citizens, as a kind of solidarity appropriately extended only to those within the charmed circle of national membership. My argument here, to put it in a highly condensed form, is that this whole way of thinking about distribution has less and less purchase today, both in Southern Africa and in much of the rest of the world, as increasing proportions of people fall out of both the labor and the citizenship frames of inclusion. These include the surging new urban masses who don't gain their livelihoods either from working the land, they are no longer peasants, or by selling their labor, they cannot become workers but instead pursue what I have termed elsewhere distributive livelihoods. That is, livelihoods that depend not on selling one's labor, but on accessing the income streams of others via social or political claims. Those falling out of the frame also include those who, with or without access to paid labor, are unable to access citizenship-based forms of distribution, including social protection due to migration and the associated lack of documents, the so-called illegals, who in Southern Africa and elsewhere comprise an increasingly large share of the poor, but who as residents but not citizens lack political rights and distributive entitlements alike. Given these increasingly huge and hard to ignore gaps in the world's systems of distributive allocation, I wish to pose the question of what other grounds, what legitimate principles or political arguments beyond those rooted in labor and citizenship are available to support new sorts of distributive claims? What new ways are emerging for answering the questions, who gets what and why? Here I point to two broad areas of emergence. One, Claims of what I call ownership comes from my recent work in the book Give a Man a Fish. The other, involving the claims of what I call presence, is something I'm trying to work out in a, still, in a new, uh, still in progress paper, brief excerpts from which I will include in what follows. With respect to what I'm calling ownership, 
I begin by observing that even those who are partly or wholly excluded from the world of productive labor may still make strong distributive claims by styling themselves as members of a collectivity understood as a rightful or ultimate sort of owner. Marxism, with its labor theory of value and its fundamental understanding of the oppressed as workers, has always struggled with the politics of the non-worker, the so-called lumpen masses excluded from the putatively revolutionary class of wage laborers. But I suggest in Give a Man a Fish that we are heir to a rich set of alternative left traditions that may have more to offer to those excluded from a role in the production system. The anarcho-communist Peter Kropotkin, for instance, always insisted on starting with universal claims of distribution and a notion of distributive justice ultimately rooted in societal membership and not just labor. Where does our vast wealth come from? Why are we so much more productive than our great grandparents? We are not better people than they were. We certainly do not work harder. Instead, we are able to produce vast riches they could not have dreamt of only thanks to a vast worldwide industrial apparatus of production, an apparatus built up through generations of work, sacrifice, and invention across centuries, even millenniums of human history, in a process that generated massive suffering for millions all across the globe. And to whom does this vast wealth-producing apparatus really belong? Surely not only to the corporate stockholders who now outrageously claim to own it outright, but to the descendants of all those who worked and imagined and suffered and bled to create it. In short, to all of us. The whole system of production in this conception must be regarded as a kind of collective inheritance. And from this universal claim of common ownership, Kropotkin derives a universal distributive claim. Surely at least some portion of the entire output must be due to each and every one of the rightful owners of the apparatus of production. Everyone, that is, must receive a share. Note that it is not the worker as worker whose claims are prioritized here, but the member of society, the inheritor of a great common estate in which each and every one of us has a share. It is not just labor that founds that inheritance in this view, but also things like suffering, bloodshed, ingenuity, and shared experience. It is therefore the entire society that is the source of value. And it is all members of that society, and not only those currently employed as workers, who as inheritors and co-owners of the whole are entitled to a rightful share of society's proceeds. Such arguments, I have said elsewhere, are not only of academic interest. As I show in Give a Man a Fish, remarkably similar arguments have been put forward recently by advocates for Namibia's basic income grant campaign, who propose that each and every Namibian should be entitled to a monthly cash payment precisely because they, as the nation's citizens, are the real owners of the country and its considerable mineral wealth, and therefore ought, as they say, to share in the country's wealth. Receipt of a modest monthly payment in these arguments is rendered simply as the receipt of a share that is properly due to an owner. The most basic citizenship right is thus understood not as the right to vote, but as the right to partake in the wealth of the nation. Direct grants from the state in this understanding, need not bring with them the shame or stigma of receiving charity or getting a handout. In receiving a rightful share, Namibian citizens in this conception are simply partaking in the wealth that rightly belongs to the whole nation. And in doing so, they, 
as rightful co-owners of that wealth are not receiving a gift or being offered help. They are claiming what is already rightfully their own, a rightful share. But such arguments about shares and sharing, however powerful, are founded upon their own form of exclusion, insofar as they are based on membership in a bounded collectivity, the nation, institutionally represented by the state. And this, of course, is linked to the second set of problems I identified at the start. In a highly mobile world, many of the poorest members of many national populations today are those who lack most completely the protections offered by the state since they are non-citizens. This raises a key question. On what basis other than shared national membership might a distributive obligation, that is an obligation to share, rest? I try to begin to address this question in a new paper now in progress via an argument about what I call presence. Here, I very briefly summarize one part of that paper. Reviewing the anthropological literatures on sharing, I find something quite general about the obligation to share. In the most basic possible terms, I observe that we find such an obligation specifically when the person whose claim to a share might or might not be honored is both one of us what I refer to as the attribute of membership, and here among us, which I refer to as the attribute of presence. Okay, so there's two attributes that are relevant to this. First, is, is the person one of us, the attribute of membership? Is the person here among us, the attribute of presence? My observation here is that one of these attributes without the other may have some force in producing distributive obligation but never the full force that comes with both membership and presence. This distinction between criteria of membership and those of presence is, I think, clarifying. And I would have a better chance of convincing you of that if you read the whole paper. But a quick turn to Southern Africa reveals how these two principles can be brought together in a more dynamic way than Western observers are used to as presence and membership there often sit in a much more fluid relationship. In European societies, blood and soil have long served as principles of exclusion, such that one may be expelled or excluded either for having the wrong descent or for be having been born in the wrong place. But Southern African societies are in the long durée, if not always at present, historically disinclined to kick out foreigners and highly sophisticated at devising means for incorporating them as what anthropologists of Africa have called wealth in people. And in the service of securing such wealth, they have traditionally had a more supple and lively conception of how belonging may be linked to both territory, including soil, and bodily substances, including blood. Over time, foreigners have often been held to become durably attached to a place through things like labor, as their sweat mingles with the soil, and suffering, as shared suffering and spilled blood creates a spiritual unity rooted in the lived experience of co-dwelling. Here it is not juridical citizenship that is at issue, where you were born, who your parents were, but the material entailments of shared physical presence, suffering through the same drought, sweating into the same soil. Being here in this long political tradition counts for a lot. And over time, such physical presence actually becomes both a kind of membership and an identity of substance. A neighbor is therefore a position from which strong claims can emerge. A gifted Zambian ethnographer, Patience Mususa, has recently given a fine example of this from the Zambian Copper Belt. Having purchased for her own use a fixer-upper house in an urban neighborhood of Luansha on the Copper Belt, 
Masusa was soon approached by a neighborhood man who asked if he and his family might move into a spare room at the back of her property on the understanding that his wife would, in exchange, serve as a domestic worker. The ethnographer politely declined and explained that she did not need a domestic worker and did not intend to rent out the room. But when she took possession of the house a few weeks later, she found that the family had simply moved in. Her outrage was quickly checked, though, by the reactions of her neighbors, who asked her just what then she did intend to do with that room. In their eyes, she realized to have an unoccupied building would have been, as she puts it, too selfish indeed. And she reluctantly let the family stay. In a similar incident, she reported finding one day, upon her return home from work, two strange women helping themselves to some vegetables she had planted in her back garden. Unperturbed, the women cheerfully shouted, we are just stealing some vegetables from your garden. <laughs> Surely, the ethnographer reflected, living alone, I could not have eaten all the vegetables in the garden. Such helpings, as she calls them, were not only common, they were in a real way, in her words, deemed acceptable. As Thomas Vidlock has rightly insisted, among the most important modalities of sharing must be reckoned the practice of, as he puts it, refraining from interfering with someone who is about to take something. This is the logic of what anthropologists call demand sharing. And the rightfulness of the share is here rooted precisely in the simple presence of adjacency, the fact of being here, the status of being a neighbor. Yet the power of this social and political logic of presence, I suggest, remains significantly underanalyzed. Even as what I have called the membership principle, one of us, is both explicitly acknowledged in law as citizenship and endlessly subject to critical analysis as the politics of identity. The presence principle here among us has largely remained at the level of common sense. We have not yet fully realized either how central it is to enabling actual feelings of social obligation or how richly constructed is the apparently self-evident condition of being present, of being here, whatever that means. What might be gained then from a conceptual and political reworking of the idea of presence as the basis for a modern day politics of sharing? Answering this question poses the challenge of moving from the sort of literal face-to-face -face presence that we see in that Copper Belt neighborhood to a reworked and scaled up concept more suitable to modern distributive politics. An obligation to share is most readily grasped at the micro level of personal interaction. And we have a harder time imagining how it might apply to larger scales. But why is this? And why do we so easily imagine membership, in contrast, as capable of being scaled up even to hundreds of millions, as in the idea of national citizenship uniting people in a way that is analogous to membership in a family? The task here, as I see it, is to develop a better sense of what a similarly scaled up conception of presence looks like, and to identify modes of distributive politics that might be able to harness the claims of presence to press for specific distributive ends. Ways of insisting that the fact of being here, citizen or not, must be made to have more bearing on the old question of who gets what and why. Where can we find such a politics? In fact, I suggest that recent anthropological work on urban politics already points towards some key points of emergence for such a new politics. A politics that is less about membership and legal rights and more about co-presence and its practical struggles and challenges. As Partha Chatterjee once pointed out, practical imperatives of governance often mean that legal certainties of citizenship and rights give way to other logics entailed in the day-to-day -day management and administration of populations, a task that, as he puts it, involves less the representation of citizens than the government of what he calls denizens. 
Glimpses of such an emergent politics can be seen in some recent anthropological work on infrastructure and urban environments in Africa. Here we find political problem spaces of government within which urban residents are drawn together, not as fellow citizens linked by language, culture, or abstract membership in a nation, but rather as co-users of an urban infrastructure. Antina von Schnitzler's ethnography of urban water distribution in South Africa, for instance, traces the history of the state's commitment to a form of universal provision. She shows that early emphases on excluding from provision those who didn't, as some said, deserve it, that is, non-citizens and those who would not or could not pay, were quickly abandoned once the consequences became clear in the form of a cholera epidemic. It was soon observed that those cut off from the municipal water system found their own solutions, drawing water from nearby fetid ditches and pools. And before long, it became clear that cholera was not interested in who did or did not deserve to get it. And bill-paying South Africans were soon taken down by the same germs that infected the Mozambicans and the Zimbabweans and the non-paying indigent. The claim to services here was ultimately granted, not as a matter of right, but of the inescapable pragmatics of presence. In another recent example, Jacob Doherty's work in Kampala shows us a different urban scene, one in which people are linked less by political integration as citizens or by economic integration in a system of production than via a kind of urban ecology of waste and disposability. Struggles over waste unfold in a context where both conventional electoral politics and labor-based mobilizations play a part, to be sure. But along with such familiar elements of African urban politics, Doherty foregrounds a set of distributive struggles that are not reducible to them. These involve the distribution of things that follow directly from physical co-presence, the distribution of medical risk, the distribution of the social stigma of waste and odor, the distribution of mobility with its pleasures and dangers across an overcrowded and contested landscape of urban transit. Low-income people are themselves often rendered a kind of waste in this cruel politics, suffering a socially constructed disposability, even as they, like some of Kampala's animal life, sometimes find niches within which they can not only survive, but even attain a kind of tainted flourishing amidst the filth. Here, the question of who gets what is decided through a visceral and intimate embodied politics of value and stigma, status and stench. Gabrielle Hecht, meanwhile, offers an account of the political landscape left in the aftermath of the vast South African mining industry an industry whose slow but steady decline has left behind a toxic archipelago of dumps and mine tailings that disrupt and endanger urban life across much of the country, especially in the densely populated Rand. Scholars of the region know, of course, that the old production apparatus of mining generated a range of powerful social identities and forms of political leverage. What we are now starting to see is that its toxic aftermath is generating very different ones, raising issues less of labor control and class formation, and more of co-use, proximity, and shared environmental vulnerability. After all, you don't have to be a mine worker to be affected by mining's toxic aftermath. And the map of vulnerability that this toxicity has created does not align well with the more familiar mappings of labor or of citizenship. This means that even as we register the decline of a powerful and familiar form of left politics centered on working class mobilization, we must simultaneously face the challenge of analyzing the new configurations and political dangers and possibilities that are emerging in the aftermath of that decline. Here, as in the other brief examples I have given, the witnesses to the death of one kind of politics must interrupt their mourning to attend to the birth of another. 
In all of the cases that I've mentioned, concrete questions of who gets what are worked out through embodied and spatialized practices enacted by people who have been thrown together into physical proximity, into a kind of shared co-presence. And these people typically engage in these practices not as authorized members of a pre-constituted social body, a nation or a polity, but as participants in unintentional and often involuntary sorts of collectivity. Politics under these conditions, I have suggested, is less about abstract political membership and more about de facto co-usage and the pragmatic accommodations of co-presence. This is not, of course, to say that nations, citizenship, and legal rights somehow don't matter anymore, only that there is an emerging new vantage from which they may have less of a monopoly on the field of politics. The shift in perspective that I have so briefly tried here to evoke, that is, is not a matter of throwing out wrong ideas and replacing them with right ones. It is rather a matter of developing new concepts and lines of sight that bring new objects and processes into view. <coughs> a shift marked by the appearance of alternative analytical terms, such as presence, adjacency, accommodation, co-users, and so on. In conclusion, let me emphasize that I acknowledge that the modes of making distributive claims that I have discussed here may well not appear terribly potent in a world where the old constructs of labor and citizenship so often continue to dominate the conceptual landscape of distributive politics. But I would also insist that the forms of distribution that I have identified must be understood as emergent realities rather than utopian proposals. Universalistic payments based on the idea of popular ownership, for instance, to return to the first half of the paper, are not some utopian scheme, but already exist in a number of different forms. New social protection programs in several countries, for instance, link state-owned mineral resources directly to social entitlements, such as pensions and childcare grants. In the US, we have the example of the Alaska Permanent Fund, which makes all residents of Alaska shareholders in a portion of the wealth produced by oil production there. Residents receive an annual dividend check based not on their participation in production, but their legal status as state residents, i.e. as owners. And of course, similar arguments about the people's claim to the nation's mineral wealth have been drawn on quite effectively in Namibia's basic income grant campaign, which I've analyzed elsewhere. More broadly, the cash transfer schemes that have proliferated all across the global south in recent years are, it is true, still mostly conceived in a depoliticized social assistance frame. But as I suggested in Give a Man a Fish, drawing on Southern African experience, they may also be helping to lay the groundwork for new sorts of distributive politics that might help move social payments away from the old grounds of charity and help for the helpless and toward new conceptions that move in the direction of the rightful share. As for presence, here too my approach is to track real developments on the ground, not to propose some imaginary pie in the sky. In fact, as I have emphasized here, the modern politics of state service delivery reveal the very real power of social claims based on presence. Which children should attend school? Who gets vaccinated for measles? Who gets toilets? the answers often proceed not according to a logic of right, but of practical accommodation. Well, do we want undocumented kids not to be in school? What would they do then and with what consequences? Do we really want to exclude a huge chunk of the population from our vaccination campaigns? Not legal abstractions, but brute sociological and immunological facts give the answers to such questions. Certain services must, for practical as much as ethical reasons, be extended not to whoever is an authorized member, but to whoever is here. And all over the world, new forms of political assertion and pragmatic accommodation draw their force not from the claims of citizenship, but those of presence, 
The problems of government that they present involve less adjudicating the rights belonging to members than coping with the material demands of what I have termed adjacency. Finally, I want to emphasize that it is not a matter of whether or not we should have new modes of distribution. The great and growing masses of people who lack both access to land and regular wage labor and the protections of legal citizenship are not going to meekly curl up in a corner and die. They will press their distributive claims using whatever channels and levers are available to them. If the claims of labor and citizenship are not available to them, they will find other grounds for making distributive claims. And we will have to come to terms with new ways of thinking and new sorts of arguments. Arguments that whether we like it or not will disrupt our long established ways of answering that old question, who gets what and why? Hi, Ed. Thank you very much for your question. My name is Fraser. I'm from the University of Pretoria in South Africa. So as I was listening to your, your presentation, I really couldn't help think about the, the realities of what's happening in South Africa today, now as we talk. And you did mention that citizenship isn't going anywhere, it's going to come back. But I, I couldn't help but try and see a real harsh juxtaposition between ideas of ethno-nationalisms, the xenophobia that, that's killing people as we talk in, in South Africa at the moment. So is it not more a case of citizenship and what you call presence co coexisting in some messy dynamic than one against the other? Well, Jim, very, thank you very much. Beautiful uh, presentation. But I was, uh, like my, the other uh, person uh, asking a question, I was also wondering whether membership isn't rearing its ugly head in all sorts of different political forms and ways uh, in many countries, certainly here in the West, uh, certainly in the US, certainly right now here in the UK, certainly also in continental Europe. I mean, building walls. Europe doesn't have to build a wall. It has a sea where people can be drowned. Um, so it's, it seems like the political current goes a little bit ag against the vista that you try to show us. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so let me, those, those are closely related. Um, yeah, no doubt uh, citizenship is a big deal, and not least in a place like South Africa where it's actually worth something in material terms. Um, um, at the same time, um, if you talk to people who work on social assistance and poverty alleviation and so on, they'll say, you know, actually the poorest people in the neighborhoods where we work aren't South Africans, right? They're, they're Mozambicans, they're Zimbabweans, and where it's their grant, right? So, um, they certainly coexist, right? Identifications based on citizenship and those based on presence um, coexist and often in, in a not very um, compatible way, right? There's open warfare over who does and doesn't have the, the right. Um, I'll just say it's, South Africa particularly is a very clear example of where xenophobia is a, is a powerful political emotion, but it is in no way a solution to the, to the problem. I mean, South Africa is, is on a big continent full of people who are not South Africans. And it's, I don't think they're gonna build a wall. You know? I, um, they're, they're gonna have to figure out new political accommodations that are capable of offering some kind of incorporation to people 
who are not, I, I was just in uh, Ghana, and my hosts there told me that 45% that of the population of Accra are not Ghanaian citizens. I don't know if that's true, but that's what they told me. Um, well, think about what it means to govern a population where half of the members of the capital city are not, in fact, citizens. Citizenship as a construct for governing, for solving problems of government, uh, is very limited under those circumstances. Um, and I guess, Oscar, I'd say the same. Um, I'm not sure the trend is, is going in the other direction. I think that the trend ever since 19th century nationalism started to have its way is that it has colossally failed. And it has shown that people move around. People have always moved around, as anthropologists know. And the idea that you're going to take a group of people who share a language and a culture and put them in a little sealed box and keep them there seems hopelessly archaic to me. I mean, they may kill a lot of people in the process trying, trying to, uh, to hold back the tide, but I, 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 ju I don't think that's a, gov a program for governing. It may be a program for getting elected, but that's a different matter. for a wonderful talk of such clarity. But I want to ask uh, probably the most obvious question, and you just brought it up. In a world in which people are constantly on the move, mm -hmm. constant, on a range, larger numbers of refugees than ever, migrations that are not about one week away, but circularities of migration, how do you decide presence? What about all of those who are not present Let's, let's think of Palestine. Let's think of those who cannot return. And you say, well, that's easy, Anne. They're, they're in, you know, in, in Michigan, so they have presence, and then they get those rights there, and the distributive rights there. But there's, there's, there's so much movement that doesn't stop. It's not as if you go and then you come back and you're part of that world again. It's almost a, a, a constant mobility of sorts that um, are displacing people and themselves displacing, displacing themselves. I mean, it's, it's obvious. I just, I know you've thought about it more than I have, so could you address well, it? Thanks very much, yes. Um, it, it, there's, a, of course, more to the paper that I alluded to than I right. presented here. <laughs> and part of it is about the, the constructedness of this condition of being present, right? It, it, being present is not a simple sort of feature of the physical spatial arrangements. Um, presence requires a kind of recognition. And it requires a process of what I call rendering. People are present only when, they've been, when they're rendered present. And there's a complex social and semiotic process that has to take place, uh, much like people being members, right? The, the construction of membership. Are you really one of us? Are you, are you a true German? Does German blood flow through your veins? Right? I mean, there's an enormous amount of cultural work that goes into making the answer to that seem obvious. Um, and the same is true, and this is why I, 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 my appeal is for a sort of more balanced set of, uh, uh, of critical energies. Not that we should stop doing the work we've been doing on membership and identity and belonging, but that it should be complemented by a, a similarly ambitious uh, uh, critical project of looking at this question of, of what it means to be here, what it means to be present, and what, is the, what are the processes through which presence is rendered. Um, the other thing is, um, I haven't presented this paper very much, but when I have, people have understood it as somehow very optimistic, and I, I don't know why that is, because I'm not particularly optimistic. Uh, I mean, I, I, do, I do assert that there will be new modes of distributive claim making, but that's not necessarily something to be optimistic about. Right? I mean, when mobs of people come into your house and cut off your head and take everything you own, that, that's a new distributive claim, right? Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to result in more democratic societies or more egalitarian societies, but it will result in societies that are organized in ways in which citizenship and labor are no longer those kinds of, kind of anchors that they are today. Um, so I think um, what my attitude is let's keep our, uh, our ears to the ground and attend to what's coming up from below. Um, and you know, some of it is very scary. Um, some of it is, is more hopeful, I think. Uh, and it's probably good to, to sort of pay attention to, to both sides of that. But I'm not, I'm, I'm, my project is not to, to perform that judgment or, or to say, you know. I didn't think yeah, you okay, were. I was just yeah. asking what is absence. What is? What is absence? Oh, yeah. When, what, how do you make those distinctions? That's all. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really yeah. Ask. Okay. That, well, that's a crucial question.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to, to talk a bit more about or your comment on, on, on this idea of um, rendering present, especially in a digital world. Mm -hmm. For example, where transnational families, they have to deal with aging um, and um, uh, different members of, of a family. They, they want to be present and they maybe use Skype or whatever. And uh, in that sense, physically they're absent. But uh, so how yes. does this come in? Hi, um, thank you. That was fascinating and a uh, and lot to take away. Um, you've, you've kind of touched on it already, so I just actually want to push a bit further there, um, because I was thinking when you were talking uh, particularly about the example of the bedroom in the house and the presence, the politics of presence around that. Um, in the UK, we've had an example of a shift from a politics of labor and work to a politics of presence in our social benefit system uh, that was called the bedroom tax. And basically, people were taxed, often disabled people, for not having present others in their house. Um, yes, yes. And so that was making me think about where this shift is leading to uh, less positive visions. And so seeing as you touched on that, I was wondering if there are any particular examples where, where you're concerned about the shift or, or that you've been dwelling on or thinking on that, that you think yes, particular yes, risks yes. and how to address those. Yeah, let, let me take all of these. Um, the, the digital thing is, is really important um, because of course, um, our ideas about what it means to have a community or to have a friend, um, you know, have been, have been quite thoroughly transformed by the social media revolution. Um, my guess is that people of my generation are probably not gonna be the best analysts of that because it's still quite a foreign language for me. Um, I, I was struck though um, at the, the way uh, some of the coverage in Syria, I mean, of course, most people don't watch news, so I'm not sure what impact this has, at least in my country, they don't. Um, but when, the, when things were really turning very, very ugly in Syria, there were, there were a number of cases of people who were being killed while they were online streaming it to their friends, basically, right? Saying, oh, they're coming now, they're coming now, I hear them at the door, you know. And, and the horror of, of being there while it happens, right? And sort of experiencing it through, through your, your little screen. Um, it was much more visceral than reading in a newspaper that so many hundred people were killed yesterday in Syria. Um, and more visceral than just watching, it on, watching a sort of coverage on TV too, because it's personal, because it's, because it's, you know, it's your friend, it's your... So um, I do think that, that that has to be part of the analysis of rendering present, right? What do we mean by present? What do we mean by the feeling obligated to someone because after all they're here among us, right? Here among us, that requires to be unpacked, that requires a critical analysis. Um, on, the, on the question of, um, of being here in the context of social assistance, um, interestingly, the, the trend has been in the other direction in, in Southern Africa, which is to say, and certainly in South Africa, there was quite a highly developed idea of um, social interventions as involving a kind of paternalistic process of forming people into proper families. Right? So certain kinds of, of benefits might be discontinued if you were found to be a woman who was uh, having children without, be, without being in wedlock or you know, ver various kinds of moralistic policings of, of the, the uh, family structure. The interesting thing is that when they introduced the new child care grant in South Africa, they explicitly jettisoned all of that. And they said, oh, the, the grant is for the child and it will be paid to whoever's caring for the child. And we don't care if it's the mother or the mother's sister or the mother's mother or the mother's lesbian lover or somebody who's not uh, a relative at all. Whoever it is, we don't care. We're not gonna try to keep track of that. We're not gonna try to form people into optimum families because we don't think we know what an optimum family is. Right? This was the thing. We think people know their own circumstances far better than we ever will. We're gonna give them some resources that enable them to do whatever it is they're doing and do it better. But we're not, we're, we're gonna abandon that age old ambition of social policy to sort of use the force of social interventions to mold proper families. 
In fact, the word family doesn't even appear. Um, so, you know, any, I mean, you can gloss that, I guess, as, uh, as dystopian, as, you know, nobody cares how children are being cared for or something. But I think for, for many people, it's, it's been liberatory. And in some ways, that, that is what the old feminist critique of, um, of welfare wanted, right, was, was for, for the state to sort of get off the backs of women and let them, let them live with who they want and let them raise children how they want. Um, so in that sense, it's a membership logic, right? You get the benefit because you're a South African and because you have a child under the age of 18. Um, and it's, um, you, you don't have that kind of familized presence that you were, that you were I think, evoking, um, and which has certainly been an important thing in much of the rest of the world. Thank you for that fascinating talk. I have two questions, if that's all right. I'll be quick. Um, the first one, where you talked about the sort of brute sociological and immuno immunological facts as like a driving factor or rational for redistributive politics, where does violence and rage fit into this? And especially the violence and rage of people who are here but don't feel seen and don't feel recognized. And I'm thinking particularly in the context of South Africa and the brutal rape and murder of this young UCT student um, and also the rape and murder of young women who have become targeted by this rage in South Africa by men who feel not recognized um, by the state. So that's my first question. The second question, um, and I'm still struggling to articulate this, but I'm thinking in the context of Indian politics, and I'm thinking in the context of what's happening in Kashmir right now, um, and how the, this, this warped idea of distributive politics or a warped version of distributive politics and its co-option by the right-wing state, where the Indian government essentially currently argues that mainstream or mainland Indians should have the right to share in Kashmiri resources. They should have the right to build uh, houses on Kashmiri land. They should have the right to ha uh, have businesses there. And then that is used as a form of a larger, uh, and marry as well, absolutely, marry Kashmiri women. Um, so I just wanted to hear from you a little bit about the danger of the co-option of this, um, and whether there are some marginalized communities that should have the right to not have to share as well. So, um, yes, violence is definitely part of the politics of presence. It's one of the reasons why you, in so many cases, simply can't ignore people even though you'd like to ignore them, or even though you may consider that they shouldn't be here in the first place, or they have no rights, or in, in normative theoretical terms, they may not, in fact, be, member, be, be part of the society at all. But there are a bunch of practical reasons why they have to be attended to, and one of them is the threat that, that, that's posed by violence. I have a paper comparing the, the current um, propertyless masses of Southern Africa with the old um, citizens, propertyless citizens called proletarians in ancient Rome that Marx wrote about. Um, and in both cases, um, these are people who don't have the economic power of being proletarians in the modern sense. Um, but who do have certain other powers, including citizenship and the constant threat that they may be mobilized for violent purposes. Um, and as for the, the kind of reactionary uses of, of distributive claims, um, that's also part of the package, right? I mean, what I, what I say opens up around distribution is not an egalitarian program for living in peace. What opens up is a politics, precisely, right? And a politics is capable of producing different outcomes. That's what makes it interesting. Um, and certainly distributive claims have been harnessed to frankly reactionary and, uh, and chauvinistic causes. They're often, nobody's mentioned this, but they're very often tied up with various forms of patronage um, that undermine uh, the egalitarian democratic citizenship in its most familiar form. Um, at the same time, in the very same world, we have forms of distribution that have been explicitly egalitarian. Each person gets exactly the same thing. 
and that have been anti-patronage in the sense that they have been uh, distributed through technocratic systems that on the whole actually insulate them from the, the tyranny of having to go beg the local politician for your, for your monthly check. You go to a cash machine and it spits it out at you, right? So, you know, I, I'm always thinking about, about dangers and possibilities, right? Being attentive to both and not being too quick to sort of ignore the other. Um, thank you very much for an absolutely fascinating talk. My question <coughs> follows on a bit on the mobilities and absences question. And I was wondering um, where the space of transience is in the politics of presence and how one's present is different if one is a transient person than if one is not. Specifically thinking about the example now of South Africa, where I live in Cape Town, there's a lot of Malawian migrant laborers um, who are criticized by the local South Africans for taking on very low pay, not making uh, demands around their labor rights, but often do so be precisely because they're only there for a short time, maybe three or four years, and then they leave. And a lot of their money that they make is not reinvested into the space in which they live, but of course sent home. So a, an important marker of their presence is actually that it's transient. So I was wondering how much that plays out in the politics that then develop. Yeah, well, of course, it's, it's crucial in, in legal terms. If you're trying to establish whether you're a legal resident, they want to know how many, lives you've, how many years you've lived there. Do you live there continuously? Do you own property? I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole specification of what it means to, to be of a place in, in legal terms. Um, but it's, I'm also struck at how differently the, the issues are posed for people in different class positions. Um, I was just in Namibia. And people were talking about all the migrants and all these people who come from outside and are, you know, uh, um, they're, they're not even planning to stay in Namibia. They're going to go back someplace else and harumph, harumph. Um, and somebody said, well, why didn't you mention the white South Africans who are here doing exactly the same thing, right? And they don't have any problems. They don't, they're, not, they're not set upon by angry mobs, right? Why is it that you only pick poor black people to turn your hatreds against? Um, so I think that that's important, right? Trans transience um, gets read very differently in, in different contexts. But I think it, it's, it's part of what I'm saying about, about presence is that it's not just a yes or no. It's, it's not just uh, a, a sort of a physical characteristic that you, can, that you can check. It requires long processes of interpretation and discussion and debate. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is about, um, again, presence and absence. Well, it, because it's complicated and I need to, I feel the need to ask this question. If presence creates um, identities, then um, how to ensure the continuity of a collectivity or a community um, because of um, alternative collectivities and fluid identities and multiple belongs in, belongings, first of all. I mean, people can be present in different ways and that means they can also have multiple belongings, so how to solve this problem? Thank you. Mine's a very different question. Do you want to take that one first? Uh, yeah, why don't I? Um, um, well, I think the interesting question is what enables people to mobilize, to band together for common purposes? Um, and <coughs> The way you put the question suggests that that must be some form of belonging. Um, and I'm suggesting maybe not. Maybe belonging is one of the ways that people band together and unite in forms of mobilization. But there may be other people who don't particularly feel a sense of belonging, who don't, are not part of the same national story, who don't speak the same language. But they're exposed to the same toxic dump, for instance. Think about all those, those people in Accra who, who don't share a nationality, who don't have legal rights. Um, what are some of the things that might enable them to band together? And maybe it would be a kind of shared vulnerability, right? Or maybe it would be something that affects your way of life in a way that bypasses questions of cultural belonging and meaning um, in, in the way that the examples that I gave do. Um, and 
that will also generate forms of solidarity and forms of mobilization, but they won't look like the old comradely horizontal uh, trade union kind of solidarity. They'll have different characteristics and they may be shallow in, in relation to the, the deeper solidarities of national membership or of, of workplace-based identity. That may, that may be the case, but even shallow reckonings of, of, of a common predicament uh, can produce results in terms of, of achieving distributive outcomes. Um, Yeah, I think that's, that's probably a different question. Yeah. Okay, yes, this is a slightly left field question, okay. <laughs> but I'm curious, and so thank you for making me curious. Um, there's a presence that's not present at all in your discussion, which is that of the non human. And I'm very conscious listening to you that when you're talking about distribution, you're talking about extraction from non human beings, water, etc. Um, which have their own needs and interests, which are never represented in conversations about distributive justice at all. And in the time that we've been talking here, about five or six species have gone extinct because we continue to extract and distribute the resources that they also need, but are, are being overridden. And I just wonder what your thinking looks like if we add into the equation the rights and interests of the non-human. Yes, um, I'm of two minds about this. On the one hand, I think that the, the theme of presence is capacious, right? You, to, to have human rights, you have to be human, but to have presence, you need only be present. And so there's no reason why you can't have an analysis of, um, of non-human entities uh, that treats their presence as a salient um, uh, point of connection with, with other kinds of entities. At the same time, one of the things I'm, I'm trying to do is to understand the emergence of a new kind of social obligation. Um, and, you know, this is an old theme in social theory. Durkheim said that the heart of social obligation is the moral relationship we have to each other. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've, I've read all the uh, ANT stuff and scallops and all that, but I don't have, I don't believe scallops have moral obligations toward me. I don't think they think they have moral obligations to me. And so I'm not sure that we really want to, uh, to stop asking those questions that are specifically about the kind of obligations humans have to each other. I don't think that necessarily entails not being interested in other kinds of, of entities and the relations that they have with each other and with us. But it's, it's not the same project. And, and f um, so for me, I'm register, register me as only um, half convinced. Uh, thank you. It's, I guess it's semi-related to both of these uh, uh, questions and your answer answers. Um, so in terms of the finding something in common, you use the example in Accra with the toxic waste and the fact that people would maybe commiserate together or deal with that together and that might form a different type of sociality or a way to relate to each other over that. And that means sort of elephant in the room for sort of climate change and people and, and certain Parts of, I mean, the world has ended for many of the, m many humans for the past few centuries. Uh, the world is already over for them. Um, so, in terms of thinking about the world ending in the specific ways, these like you know, in 2050, these these apocalypse visions of what will happen and what is happening, what will get worse. Um, imagining that we're here together on Earth, I can hopefully maybe not articulate it as so utopian that it can't be imagined that a universal basic income for mining the world as it has been mined for the humans and the non-humans on, on this planet um, would also halt perhaps a lot of global migration that's economic in nature, certainly not the climate migration um, issues, but a universal basic income would be something to also envision as a type of presence on Earth as we flee from cyclones mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. deal with water issues. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we have two questions at the back, so I'm going to the last question. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> my question actually follows nicely on from that. Um, and it's, um, 
in these emergent realities that you talk about in terms of like this presence, uh, also the notion of temporality and a lot of the claims that are being made in terms of climate change are made on behalf of future generations who are not present to um, speak for themselves, but who are made present through, uh, for example, the lawsuits over climate change that are going on in various places of the world, or this like notion of mobilizing for the school strikes are not just for the present generation, but also in terms of the future generations. And so I'm just wondering um, how to think of those alongside the kinds of claims of universal basic income and um, and of, of co-presence in the, in, the, in, in the here and now, but also with the kind of bearing in mind that a lot of the mobilization for, for these kinds of claims are made also with a, with a look to, to the future. Yeah, thank you very much in, indeed. I, I wanted to ask about um, these attributes of sharing and to suggest maybe a couple of others. I was very struck by your examples and, and I thought that what seemed to really motivate the sharing in both of the cases was also a sense of the need of the other people involved. And I wondered if that might be something that you'd consider building, building into. Uh, as an attribute or whether that's somehow subsumed by presence. But I also wondered about um, the uh, something that we might call something like sense of resonance of experience. And there's something that maybe doesn't relate to presence but actually to past experience. And what I was thinking about there was that um, in uh, Germany, in the welcome movement that um, developed in relation to the long summer of migration, one thing that we, we, we saw was that quite often people were making analogies to things past in their families or others that they had known um, in the past. So my question is, could they also be other things that you might add as attributes to this um, idea of sharing? Yes. Um, well, I think what's most striking in the anthropological literature on sharing is how little it has to do with the feeling bad for somebody and therefore wanting to be generous to them, right? which is kind of the Western idea of what, what sharing is. You share because you're a nice person and somebody is in need. Um, and the, the, the sharing literature comes out particularly with the foragers, which is where the, the topic has gotten the most extensive development. Uh, really emphasizes that um, you don't decide to give someone something because you feel sorry for them. They come up and they take it, and you have no right to stop them from taking it. That's why it's called demand sharing, right? They take it because it's theirs. It doesn't belong to you just because you're the hunter who happened to fell the antelope. It's not your personal property. Right? You bring it back and whoever's there takes a share. Um, and there's rules about who takes which share and who goes first, and there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of social stuff, as you'd expect. But the, the really robust idea of sharing that comes out of this is at the opposite pole from the idea of, of the, the, the beneficent gift, which is given by the greater party to the lesser party. Um, and in fact, when, when people do receive their share of the meat, they de-emphasize anything like gratitude. Right? They don't say how wonderful, thank you for bringing it. They say, this is terrible, this meat isn't, isn't, isn't half as good as it should be. Why do, you, why do you waste our time with this, right? So it's symbolically sort of reducing the distance between the, the one who's receiving and the one who's, who's quote, giving, but giving isn't really the right. Anyway, all that. Um, the, 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 both of the last two questions uh, deal with this, this idea of, of claims across generations. Um, and that's always, I, I thought, one, one of the real attractive parts of Kropotkin. I read you a couple of passages from Kropotkin. Um, but he emphasizes that the, that which requires to be distributed is the product of many, 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 many generations of life and labor and, and ingenuity and production. Um, and so you can't say that the people who have jobs now are somehow pulling their weight and everyone else is not. Um, the, the wealth that's being produced was produced by all of those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of generations cumulatively. Um, and, and so it, 
it means that people who've never had the opportunity to participate in the production system still have the standing of owners, right? They have the standing of owners because they inherited. Um, that has implications too, I think, for the future, right? If, we, if you think of our relation to the future, not just as preceding it or being less developed than it, but as rather um, leaving an inheritance, right? Um, that, that might be a useful way of thinking about it. Um, the, the climate change thing, of course, um, is, is very close to my, to my heart. Um, it is the kind of condition that I evoked in places like mine tailings dumps in South Africa or in a, a situation of uh, localized uh, endemic disease. Um, but of course, it's an entire planetary condition. Um, and the basic income people have had a planetary focus from the beginning. I don't know if, if anyone follows basic income, uh, but the, the worldwide network is called the Basic Income Earth Network. Uh, and they explicitly uh, uh, envision national programs of basic income as a first step on the way to something that would be a, that would be a, a worldwide kind of global citizenship. Um, and I think, you know, at the level of practical politics, it, it, it's probably misplaced to spend a lot of time talking about how do we do that because we're nowhere close. Um, but I, I do think it's um, it's useful horizon to have in mind when we think about, well, what are the emergent forms of politics here? And then you, you read about some of the things, the literature that I've been citing here, and you think, okay, but isn't that all of us, right? We, we all live on the same toxic dump, right? It's called Earth. Um, and we're all suffering from it, and maybe we can all band together based on that shared condition. Um, I think it's, it's an, a nice thought to leave us with. Thanks. So I'd just like to say, um, on behalf of everybody here, um, I, I should say one thing before, don't all rush off before we give a vote of thanks. I think Emma has a couple of administrative and 